And welcome to the 24th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee. We appear to be two members down, but neither has given their apologies, so I take it they will deign to appear at some point. Our first item of business today is to decide whether to items 4, uh, 6 and 7 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members agreed. Here's Richard. Um, our second item of business is to take evidence on the Scottish rate of income tax as part of our scrutiny of draft budget 2016-17. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting Dr. Jerry McCartney, Head of Public Health Observatory, NHS Scotland, Stephen Boyd, Assistant Secretary of the STUC, and Rukia Khan. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, I'll say that every time I see you, I don't know why. Uh, sorry, what did I say? Khan. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to say a heavy night last night, but that'd be a lie. Uh, Rukia Shah. Policy Manager at the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Uh, members have received copies of the written evidence submitted by our witnesses, so we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And I think you all know the drill. Basically, I'll ask some opening questions, and then I'll open out the session to uh, colleagues around the table. So, um, first one that I'll, I'll ask about is, uh, is your own, uh, Dr uh, McCartney, and uh, other panellists can obviously feel free to comment um, in terms of this and uh, each person will be able to comment on, on the other's uh, submissions. So what you say, Dr McCartney, is that um, basically uh, uh, in terms of the rate for SRIT, you talk about the flexibility being afforded to the Scottish Parliament in relation to SRIT facilitates only modest changes to income equality. Um, and in your paper, you obviously argue um, that uh, we need an, uh, you know, um, enhanced regulation and taxation in order to reduce inequalities in income, wealth and, and uh, power inequalities across society. And therefore, you say that uh, we would therefore support the introduction of SRIT at a rate higher than 10 per cent. But you're a wee bit coy on how much higher, so I'm just wondering if you can possibly tell us what kind of rate of SRIT you would think would be appropriate at the current, this current time. Um, I'm going to continue to be coy on that point, if that's all right. If the basis of us commenting on this, you might be slightly wondering why a, a Scottish Health Board are engaged in this debate at all. Our role is, in Scotland is to reduce health inequalities and support government and other agencies to reduce health inequalities. Members will be aware that health inequalities in Scotland are wider than anywhere else in Western and Central Europe, and thousands of people die prematurely as a result of that inequality. Health inequalities are driven in turn by inequalities in income, wealth and power in society, and so we need to do everything we can to reduce those. So we've been tasked by the Scottish Government and by our board to look at the policies and practices that are most effective at reducing those inequalities in health and so the basis of our evidence here is some modelling work that we did in-house which looks at the impact of a range of interventions both health interventions around alcohol and smoking but also upstream interventions in the economy including the Scottish rate of income tax and the modelling concludes quite quite clearly that those interventions that focus on financial aspects including um, increasing the um, the minimum wage, uh, increasing the rate of social security benefits such as GISA income support, but also the use of the, an increase in the Scottish rate of income tax would all be very effective means at reducing health inequalities by providing you know, some redistribution of income to a greater or lesser degree. And so the more you redistribute in a sense, the greater the impact would be on reducing health inequalities. So that's the basis of our evidence and I'm happy to talk to members about how we did that modelling and, and how robust it is. Yeah, I mean, I know that's the basis of your evidence because I've got a paper in front, of you, in front of me, but you still haven't told us why you haven't come up with a, a, a sum. I mean, one of the reasons we're taking evidence is we're trying to make recommendations to the Scottish Government as to what SRIT would be, and it's not really helpful when people don't actually come up with a, a figure. So uh, uh, given what you've said and given the fact you think it should be increased, why have you not said it should be up to one pence, two pence, three pence, or whatever? I mean, it seems to me a bit strange. That sure. Well, you made the argument, but not you've not. Okay. You've kind of stopped just before the finishing line. Okay. Well, we were limited in the modelling, so I can only speak on the evidence that we've got available. I can't speculate. That's a clear role that I hold as a as a, a public health consultant. Um, and the evidence we've got available to us was based on some modelling done by the University of Stirling, which um, modelled different. Um, interventions in the financial system, including a one pence variance in the Scottish rate of income tax. And it's that one pence variance that we were able to then feed into our modelling, the triple I model. And so I could tell you here that a one pence increase in the standard rate of income tax would reduce 
um, the relative index of inequality, which is a measure of inequalities in health, by half a percent uh, over 20 years. So that, um, you know, that's what we've got in the model. You could speculate and say that increases beyond that would reduce it by more. But you know, it's to give some figure that would give you some sort of um, some handle on the magnitude of impact of variance in, in income. We're certainly looking to do a further range of income interventions in the next phase of the tool, um, and we can maybe come back next year and report on that, but we don't have the modelling of the financial implications of different um, interventions at this point in time. Okay, fair enough. Um, in terms of the overall philosophy uh, that Dr McCartney has spoken about, um, Rahir, what, what's your view on that? I mean, from your paper, I would suggest it, it seems that you quite clearly agree with Dr McCartney. Just a caveat first, it's been very difficult for us to generate a, <clears throat> uh, you know, a very wide-ranging discussion within, our, within the third sector on this particular topic because it's so technical, because it's so confusing as well with, with the various arrangements. You know, the, we're talking here about transitional arrangements coming in uh, before the, the fuller arrangements that are currently being debated by UK Parliament. But uh, many of our members recognise that, you know, going to the principles, it's a diff the tax is going to be a difficult balance between simplicity, effectiveness and fairness. Um, now, the, the overriding concern for many of our members is the impact of tax on uh, some of the most uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged people in Scottish society and how much their situation is at the forefront of, discussion, of decisions and discussions around the decisions around what level tax is set at. Now, having said that, the, with those caveats um, in mind and the fact that we have not been able to generate that discussion, we have spoken to our policy committee and uh, to the third sector forum, which uh, brings together some of the sector leaders. Now, there is a clear interest in making sure that tax is going to be accountable and transparent, but there is not much of an of a interest in, at this stage, set, giving advice on what kind of level it should be set at. The only thing that we were able to get some kind of sense of is that uh, people in general that we have spoken to do not, in the sector do not want to see tax reduced from the, the current rates. Um, when the new when the new regime comes in next year, and I think for that the the analysis there is that because of us, of the austerity and the uh, the kind of impact on public services, they don't want to see that um, suffer at this stage at this particular time. There is no particular strong coherent view about whether tax should be raised within people in our sector, and I don't th I, I can understand why they wouldn't want to put forward that particular position. There are different people that privately would hold a view whether to increase it or maintain it, but no formal position from the members that we have spoken to about raising taxes. Yeah, want to say, if extra money is raised to the SRIT, it must be used to reduce the qualities. But you, again, but, I'm, I'm, but in your paper, you also say that the. You know, you, you talk about um, politicians and others need to change the conversation around tax in order to make sure we can build a tax system that's sufficient to the needs of everyone's society. We need to make the case for what tax is for and the positive things it brings to whole society as a way to reduce inequality and support social security and public services. And later in your paper, you say uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance could say, yes, we're going to increase tax to make the SRIT 11P. With that extra money, we're going to make specific stated action to improve the lives of those specific people across the society. I seem to remember contesting an election in 1999 in which that was done, and it didn't go down particularly well with the electorate. I mean, do you not think people actually do understand what tax is for? They just no, don't necessarily want they themselves to pay it. Uh, or, or pay more of it. I don't think they do. I think you know, I think people are getting very confused now because if you think about uh, where tax is held and, and at what level, now we're, we're going to be moving into a situation where employment-related income tax is going to be devolved uh, to a certain extent during this transitional time next year, and then post hopefully and possibly towards a, a, a broader position. Um, um, when the Scotland Act 2015 is implemented. But, uh, you know, savings tax, pensions tax will remain reserved. I mean, the, the situation is so fragmented, it's going to be extremely confusing for the general public. And if you think about the people that the third sector supports, some of those that are not even involved in, uh, uh, you know, at the centre of these discussions, some of the most uh, furthest away from these discussions, it's going to be even more confusing. And, and, and you know, they will, they will just think, oh, it's just that kind of stuff that decisions will be taken at, at uh, Holyrood or Westminster, and, you know, we're just going to have to live with that. So so I think there is a bit of an issue there. Now, the key thing that we uh, are a bit concerned about is when we talk about taxpayers. We almost talk about taxpayers as if if you're not a taxpayer, 
then somehow you're not a valued member of society. Now, this is kind of the kind of thing which many of the people our support um, you know, start to get a bit kind of concerned about. There's a lot of rhetoric going on about how we need to kind of bear in mind what taxpayers do and where taxpayer money is spent. But the language can be very, very selective and disengaging for, for many of the people that are directly supported by third sector organisations. Okay, thank you. Now, Stephen, uh, you've said in your paper that the STC is concerned at the impact of a tax increase on lower wage workers. We had a bit of a philosophical discussion last week as to whether or not that was indeed the case, and we had uh, uh, Lucy uh, Hunter Blackburn arguing, in, in fact, that uh, uh, tax increases actually would help the, low, the, the people at lower end in relative terms, even with the SRIT uh, figures. Um, but you go on to say you have made it quite clear that uh, in terms of the STUC that, uh, view that uh, the Scottish Government should accompany any decision to leave SRIT 10p uh, in 2017 with a comprehensive statement on tax policy in the future. So you've said it should be, remain the same, but in the future, obviously, the, the Scottish Government should, be, should explain what it's proposing. But then you say it's feasible that in future years the STC will propose an increase in SRIT if the economic circumstances dictate that low earners could more easily bear an increase. So in one, in one, I'm a bit confused as to why you're saying the Scottish Government should have a comprehensive statement on tax policy in the future, but it seems that the STC may or may not, depending on economic circumstances. So, so it looks as if the STC is having its cake and eating and saying that you want the Scottish Government to come up with, a, with a, a future policy direction, but the STC is kind of hedging its bets. Can you, can you explain your thinking on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and first of all, can I, I maybe say that although we proposed no change this year, I mean, it was a very lengthy, we've got no problem generating discussion and debate at the STC, I have to say, we had a very long one on this. And... You know, the decision about what uh, we felt the committee should recommend this year was based on a very difficult trade-off, I think, between uh, supporting public spending levels at this time of austerity and supporting household incomes, which have been battered over the last few years. So for this specific year that under discussion, we thought keeping SRIT at 10p made sense. Now, I think the call for the Scottish Government, what we're not saying is that the Scottish Government should state what it thinks income tax should be three or four years hence. It's more an approach with it. They think you should start discussion around about income tax. I don't think we've benefited from the start of devolution, really, from a particularly mature debate in Scotland about taxation and our different approaches to it. Now, the SDC is very clear about our approach to taxation. If you want to create the kind of econ uh, economy and society that the Scottish Government tells us it wants to create, and we believe they're very sincere about that, and indeed the opposition parties in Parliament have a, a view about what kind of society they want to create, then you can really only create and sustain such a society with a significantly higher level of total taxation revenues in Scotland than we currently have at the moment. Now, you know, there was a lot of discussion during the referendum campaign about the Nordic nations, for instance. Well, Denmark and um, Sweden have total tax revenues of about 12 or 13 per cent above where we are at the moment. Norway about 8 per cent, Finland about 9 or 10 per cent, and they've been sustained over the longer term. So if we want to move towards that kind of society, we have to look at how we can generate more taxation revenue. Now, it's an approach to how you would go about doing that in the longer term. We think the Scottish Government should start discussing. So I don't think there's any contradiction between saying we should we want to kind of generate that more substantial debate about taxation policy and what we have said about our position in the in our written submission. Okay, but obviously the problem with uh, the taxes being devolved at present is we don't have the kind of flex total flexibility in terms of income taxes, you know, and that's really the kind of difficulty. In terms of the low paid, what, what would you say to the argument that was put forward last week um, uh, by Lucy Hunter Blackburn, who basically said, well, the reason the low paid would benefit in relative terms is that, say, you get £10,600, which no one pays any tax. So, say someone was earning £10,000 more than that, and it was 1%, they'd, they'd, they'd pay an extra 100 but somebody earning over 50000 pay an extra £400, and so, therefore, you know, there would be, there would be a... A kind of higher proportion in that for the person on 20 grand, it would be half a percent of total income, as the other person would be 0.8 percent. 
uh, and so therefore it would be slightly progressive, if anything, but it would it would it would allow significant resources, about three hundred and thirty million per one p, to be to be put into public services, which obviously help create sustained jobs in that sector and possibly even allow uh, more flexibility in terms of wages in that. What, 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 how do you feel about that? That argument that she put over, which incidentally was contradicted by Ben Thompson, but I'm just, I'm just looking to see what your view is on that, you know, that, that kind of perspective. Yeah, uh, not surprised it was contradicted by Ben. I mean, I think it's a it's a very serious and relevant argument, and it's one that we had within the SDC when we were uh, uh, discussing the position that we would set before the committee. Uh, it was one that was expressed very forcefully by a number of our representatives. And again, I would stress that it's one. You know, if we are having this discussion a year hence, and if the recovery has become further embedded, if real wages have continued to rise over that year, then it's one I think we would endorse at this point next year, as we've suggested in our written submission. Our point is, at this particular moment in the economic cycle, having been through what is a historically unprecedented collapse in real wages over the last five years, this is not the moment in 2016-17, this is not the moment in which to increase taxes on the lower paid. Uh, but it's not, I um, mean, it's an argument we recognise. I say it's one, if we come back here next year, it's one we might very well support. But it's very much about timing. We don't think the time is right to raise income taxes on the lowest paid. Is there, a, is there an element of frustration, would it be fair to say, in the STC that we don't have more flexibility in terms of how income tax can be implemented, and, you know, in terms of... Uh, Behind thresholds, etc., etc. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I wish we were discussing the Smith Commission powers at this moment in time, and our submission and our recommendations for next year would look very differently to the ones that we've expressed in our written submission to the committee. But we are where we are, and we're dealing with SRIT, so that is the basis on which we've made our proposals for next okay, year. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, now, Dr. McCartney, what's your view on that the time isn't right in terms of uh, uh, putting up? Um, I mean, you've obviously talked about how uh, increase in taxation will over 20 years for every 1% reduce in the quality of a quality by 0.5%. So it, it, do you think that this is something we can wait for, given the high levels of mortality? I mean, I've, I've, I've attended a number of um, present presentations with you, as, as you know, in which you've talked about even comparing you know, Glasgow to Liverpool, the significant changes, etc. So do you, is this something you think we, could, we, could, we can afford to wait on? Uh, for the reasons that, that Stephen's explained, or do you think that, uh, that now is the time to, to look at increasing taxation within the limited framework we have with SRIT? Yeah, well, I, mean, I would share Stephen's comments about the, the bluntness of the tool that's available to you at this moment in time, and, and clearly it would be much more interesting if we could dis describe a, a sharper tool where we could vary the bands and, and do much more to make the, the tool much more progressive. However, there is an urgency around this. So the Scottish Government, since 2007, and previous administrations prior to that, have been committed to reducing health inequalities, and yet health inequalities in Scotland are stubbornly high. And, you know, I deal in statistics, but we need to remember that these are individual lives that are curtailed, families bereaved, and human lives wasted, and it doesn't need to be like that. It's not like that across the rest of Europe. And so, you know, we do need to be careful that if we take money from across society with a blunt income tax tool, such as SRIT, then there are risks that some groups will be disadvantaged. But we do need to also discuss what that additional revenue would be used for, because it could be used to mitigate any loss of income that some lower income groups might have. Um, and we know that the Scottish Government is working hard to mitigate some of the so-called welfare reforms that have come from um, Westminster. So I think there is a case, a strong case, to do something soon, something urgent, something now, to increase the Scottish rate of income tax, but use that revenue to um, ensure that people on lower incomes are not penalised by that. OK, so what about that argument right here? What would you, is that an argument you would support? of the point of tax being about pooling resources for the common good, then I think the opportunity next year, I mean, you, you, you're, get, you're getting very, very, a very blunt instrument, which I kind of agree with, and, you know, that's, I, I mentioned that earlier. But the, the, the difference is that what you can do is that the fact, you get, you, the fact that the Parliament is going to be getting those powers next year, even if they are potentially transitional, is that it'll shed a spotlight on the fact that on, on income tax in a way in which uh, may not have been the case previously in Scotland. So what you've got an opportunity there is to use that spotlight to create a bigger dis debate discussion with a much wider range of people in Scotland than might have normally taken an interest in tax. 
to try and reconnect with the idea of pooling resources for the common good. Then you can start to think about the role that tax can play and how it connects with spending on public services. It's not an automatic connect. And I think uh, it's important that we get that conversation going with a, with a much wider range of people than have traditionally been involved in that conversation. So, yes, you know, the, the, it may not be a very powerful instrument you're getting next year in the Parliament, but it certainly is uh, a spotlight that you, you, you are getting on tax, on income tax, which you can use to generate a much wider debate. OK, thank you. Now, Stephen, in your paper you say the STC um, notes international evidence strongly suggests that the scale of taxation is more important for reducing inequality than progressivity, which is almost an argument for the kind of, you know, the kind of, the, the kind of t tax rises across, across the board. But surely in areas that you've quoted, such as Scandinavia, um, they are also high, highly progressive, are they not, in terms of income tax? They're, they're, they're not, actually. <laughs> well, well, I mean, let's try and work through this, because I think progressive and regressive can be used in overly simplistic fashion, these things. But actually, when you compare the UK, the structure of the whole taxation framework in the UK to that in Nordic nations, the UK is actually more progressive. Uh, higher paid workers actually pay proportionately more. Now, this is despite in Nordic nations the top rate of income tax has been significantly higher and also the threshold has been lower. So higher paid people actually pay more. The system as a whole is less progressive because workers, or people at the bottom tend to pay more as well. And that's mainly attributable to very high consumption taxes and consumption taxes being levelled on everything. But income tax levels, because obviously we're talking about SIT. I wasn't talking about the entire yeah, package, yeah. you know, of everything from excise duty to VAT to national. I'm so I, I'm, I was just talking specifically. So apologies about SIT, um, simply because we're, we're arguing about you know okay. the, 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 that that kind of particular tax at the moment. Um, but but, but, the, but well, I'll the, let you finish what you were saying anyway, yeah, because I mean, it's an interesting point. The point we were making in our submission is about the taxation framework as a whole, and if I've not made that clear in the written submission, I apologise uh, for that. But again, I mean, the point is that we can, you know, prog the progressivity of income tax or the, you know, the taxation system as a whole can become something of a shibboleth. You know what I mean? If we're wanting to, if we're making tackling inequality our first priority, then I would, what I would argue the international evidence is extremely clear about is the level of taxation, or the scale of taxation, uh, and you know, the total tax revenues that government absorbs year on, uh, year in, year out, that makes the difference in tackling inequality. And I think that you know that raises a lot of very fundamental questions for all of us. I think in taking forward a mature debate about taxation, we would argue very strongly that yes, like the Nordic nations, we need a higher top rate of income tax. We need thresholds to be lower. But I think we also have to accept that all of us will probably have to pay a bit more. I think looking at the role of consumption taxes, which we have traditionally opposed as being a regressive measure, you know, in a fairer taxation framework as a whole, I think you might start to have a very different discussion about what consumption taxes might look like and what they should be levelled on. But, I mean, this is very long-term stuff. I mean, nobody is pretending not least ourselves that we can move from where we are at this moment in time to a Scandinavian-type taxation framework tomorrow. You know, it's probably not even achievable in the longer term, but I think they tell us some pretty fundamental things about the direction of travel. OK. Uh, Dr McCartney, would you agree with that? Yeah, um, there's some of the other things that we know that work to reduce health inequalities are where we can regulate and legislate and use the tax system to um, reduce consumption of unhealthy uh, goods and services and products and encourage the use of healthy things. So um, we always support increases in tobacco taxation, alcohol taxation, duties, etc., etc., minimum unit pricing for alcohol. All of these things can shift um, and are well evidence to shift the balance away from uh, consumption of these unhealthy things and also to reduce inequalities in the consumption of these things. But ultimately, the fundamental causes of health inequalities are much more to do with the income, wealth and power that people enjoy within society. So I think um, there's no contradiction between Stephen's position and what, what we're arguing here. Gerald okay, here, do you want to add anything to that? I suppose one of the things that uh, historically we do know about Scandinavian countries is that there's also, in the same time as being high rates of tax for uh, across all the bands, you've also you also have had uh, much more universal services, and so it's much more apparent to those people who are paying those taxes at lower income bands that they can see a direct connection with the the kind of services they're getting. So they're much more willing to pay those taxes. It's that kind of uh, debate that I think sometimes is missing 
here in, in uh, Scotland and the wider UK. So I think you know, it, it, those two go in hand in hand. The, the perception is, is just as important as the way in which the, the tax system is framed in, in Scandinavia. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think the buy-in is, is, is important in terms of that. Now, uh, uh, just one final point before I move on, because I've got a number of colleagues who want to ask questions. Uh, you've said, Stephen, yours, that the, um, uh, given the context that we're in, it is not credible for the Scottish Government to prioritise inequality while proposing only a series of tax cuts. Scottish... Uh, uh, the small business bonus scheme, a passenger duty, and additional corporate reliefs. I mean, I mean, the FSB said that uh, during the recession, one in six small businesses, there's over a hundred thousand, that went bust without that. And uh, it, I, I was visited Glasgow Airport, and they said they've got over five thousand staff, uh, everything from baggage handlers to senior engineers, um, you know, retail, you name it, right across the board. And they would be able to, with a, with that air pass duty being abolished, they'd be able to significantly increase their workforce, certainly by over a thousand. Edinburgh's said similar. And additional corporate lease, well, you can argue about the modelling, but you'll, you'll have known that in the, 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 uh, the modelling suggested that uh, in the medium term there'd be 27 additional thousand additional jobs created by 3% reduction. So is it not the case that um, the whole point of these tax cuts would be in terms of boosting the economy, job creation, and therefore the actual tax revenue that would be raised? I don't accept that at all, and I would argue very strongly that the evidence from all countries and across time is that when you cut taxes, the detriment in revenues is immediate and real, and the economic outcomes are highly uncertain, and if they transpire at all, then they're long-term. If you work through each of the mechanisms you've just discussed, the small business bonus, the point we made at the time was, I mean, the average benefit is about £1,400. I mean, frankly, if businesses... You know, if the difference between a business going to the wall or not is £1,400, that business is not viable and public policy should not be attempting to save businesses such as that. It sounds brutal, but I mean, I think that is a very important point about the... Well, I think, you know, the point about small business boys, we've been asked, we've had this debate with ministers, the first minister, for a number of years, and we've been calling on evidence to be produced that describes to us in detail the uh, the benefits that the small business bonus has brought to the economy. It's never been forthcoming. We've provided our own evidence. Frankly, it's uh, somewhat out of date now, but certainly for the first two or three years of the scheme, we provided our own evidence that seemed to show there'd been no benefit whatsoever for Scotland relative to the rest of the UK. In terms of air passenger duty, I mean, it's interesting when I've heard a number of times in the last couple of years, both Edinburgh and Glasgow Airport, talking about how uh, passenger numbers have been growing exponentially, and this is before air passenger duty has been cut. So I would be surprised if there's a significant employment dividend about by cutting it further. Uh, in terms of the corporation tax, I mean, I just don't accept that modelling is credible. And even if we do accept it's credible, the additional 27,000 jobs over 30 years is, you know, a a tiny benefit, frankly, and again, it's the tyranny of large numbers. The 27,000 sounds like a big number until it's put properly in context, and when it is, you know, the benefit is marginal in the extreme. 27,000 sounds a lot of jobs in an economy the size of Scotland's, and just so, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, so, I don't know if the FSB years. would argue it's £1,400 per business. I mean, it, so are they wrong if they say one in six of their businesses would have went to the wall well, during the I mean, peak of the recession? It's on, the, it's on the basis of an unscientific uh, survey of a tiny sample of Scotland's small business community. I mean, again, I just we've had no credible academic evidence to uh, show us the benefits of the small business bonus. We have produced our own evidence. I mean, it's four years old now. I'd be happy to send it to the committee, which asked a number of questions about the scheme. None of these have ever been answered, despite repeated calls to the Scottish Government to do so. Be very helpful. Um, Dr. McCartney, what's your view on these these issues? Um, I could make a, a sort of limited comment on air passenger duty that might be relevant. Um, if we're trying to encourage economic growth with a view to increasing employment and the incomes uh, across society, and with the view that that would improve health and reduce health inequalities, that may well be useful. However, if the ways in which we increase economic growth um, result in greater air pollution and um, increase the risk of climate change, the negative impacts on health and health inequalities will more than outweigh any short-run economic growth benefits that might occur. Uh, members will be aware of the reports in the, in the press the last couple of weeks based on an annual um, report done by the Department of Health looking at the number of deaths due to air pollution 
um, across the UK and in Scotland specifically. And the numbers are staggering. I, I mean, I think something in the range of 5,000 deaths per year. So um, measures that increase economic growth and will quite clearly increase air pollution, um, we need to be careful about that. What's more, the, the premise that air passenger duty cuts will increase economic growth by increasing the number of employees at airports, I think we need to be careful about too, because the net number of um, tourists leaving Scotland through our airports compared to the number of people arriving um, is much greater in the road out than it is in the road in. And so increasing airport capacity is likely to drain economic activity as Scottish tourists go abroad to spend their money rather than spending it here. And so I think we need to be careful about the model of growth that we pursue and be uh, confident that where we are trying to increase economic growth, that will have um, a robust uh, impact on the factors that will improve health and not have inadvertent consequences that um, might not be expected. It's likely to have to go down and stay overnight in Manchester to get their holidays or go to Gatwick rather than actually decide, oh, we won't go to Loch Lomond, we'll go to Florida. I mean, I can't imagine that many folk would decide, you know, on the, <laughs> you know, in that, in that regard. In terms of air pollution, I understood less than two percent of air pollution was caused by aviation. Most of it's actually cars. There's a vast, overwhelming majority of pollution is caused by individual cars that people go on their own daily journeys. These things make a contribution. Um, and you know, uh, air pollution coming from um, planes has a particularly detrimental effect on climate change, as opposed to local nitrous oxide emissions and the diesel fumes that I think much of the mortality figures are based on. But the longer term run, the longer run impacts on climate change are much greater from um, air travel. Rakia? I suppose you'll, you'll find a diversity of views from the, the third sector as well. Clearly, there's a very strong set of organisations, uh, um, environmental charities that are uh, have made some very strong positions known on uh, air pas passenger duty and the impact, as, as Jerry has said, on climate change. There's also you know, a lot of concern amongst environmental charities about uh, changes within the UK tax system for subsidies for renewable energy. So you know, there, will be, there will be clear pockets of, of interest, uh, on, you know, um, particularly as we move towards the, the Paris Climate Change Accords in December. Um, so and there will be other parts of our sector that might well argue that, uh, you know, um, the, the impact on those people that might be going for budget airlines and so on might be bigger. But, you know, as again, that this is one of those issues where you'll get different views from the third sector and charity sector. OK, thank you. I'm now going to open up the session to colleagues around the table. Richard, to be followed by Jean. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, Dr McCartney, in your evidence, you talked, um, uh, you referred at some length to the need for preventative interventions and the need for preventative spend. This committee has been very interested in that whole area uh, on, of public policy. Uh, and last week, uh, we heard from Lucy Hunter Blackburn about the situation regarding local authority funding being in such a situation uh, that it meant that in many circumstances, families which she described as being on the edge of vulnerability, uh, weren't able to receive the support and interventions that they required. Would that, in, in your view, make an argument for, as she uh, um, uh, put forward, increasing uh, SRIT, having a rate uh, above 10%, uh, specifically for the um, uh, funding local authorities so that those services can be extended to those additional families who, who require them and, and would not, not make an important argument for that if that, if that uh, funding isn't made available, in fact, it's going to cost a public purse and potentially cost taxpayers more in the future as well. Yes, I, I would agree with um, what you describe. Um, there's a, a, a demographic issue um, occurring in Scotland and in common with you know, the rest of the Western world, whereby as our populations age, um, the length of time in which people spend in ill health and in need of health and social services increase. And that has currently and is projected to increase in the future a huge financial implication for governments, um, including the Scottish Government. And so there's a challenge there to prevent as much of that morbidity, that time spent in ill health as possible, uh, both to improve people's lives, clearly, as the prime objective, but also because of the financial implications of that. So uh, policies, practices and services that can prevent that and compress that period of morbidity, as Derek Warnless put it, um, are vitally important if public spending is to be kept sustainable in the future. Now, we know many of the factors that um, 
will allow that prevention agenda to um, be realised. And they're not all um, revenue costs. So use of legislation and regulation are very important means of prevention. So regulating the sale of alcohol, um, regulating the use of tobacco, um, regulating what we do around the food industry and the food the marketing of food are all vitally important to prevent diseases related to tobacco, alcohol, obesity, um, poor diet and so on. So it doesn't necessarily need to cost money. Um, there's lots of things the Scottish Government could do now that would prevent much of that need for spending and much of that morbidity in the future. Um, however, um, there's a lot of public services that are also highly effective at both coping with um, increasing uh, morbidity and could prevent much of that. From the early years experience of um, nurseries and, and education services through all the local authority functions, central government functions and so on. So many of these are evidenced as being effective at reducing um, subsequent ill health. So yes, spending money on that, as I've indicated in the paper, would be a highly effective way of reducing the revenue burden on the Scottish Government in the future, but also importantly, improve people's lives. Yeah, um, from from the point of view of SCVO, I mean, obviously you've not, you've not come forward and recommended a, um, a tax increase per se, but presumably amongst your membership, there that there will be a, an acute awareness of uh, the, of the strictures that there's been in public funding and, and their, their ability to invest in services, which as Dr. Paul McCartney has described, will be very important in terms of preventative measures and and um, and not having these costs for this, the, the taxpayer and those costs to opportunity and equality as well in the future. You know, for that very reason, there doesn't seem to be an appetite to reduce taxes, particularly at this time while we're going through this uh, austere um, uh, compression in public services. Um, but I, I suppose the other point I would make is that you do not need to increase taxes in order to invest in prevention. Prevention is something which you can do with budgets now. And I think uh, it, what gets in the way isn't so much the lack of money. What gets in the way of, uh, of pushing towards prevention, in my view, is the political will, fear of, of, the, of how, the, how people might receive any shift in, in major budgets away from acute services, uh, budget protectionism with some of the way in which we've organised our big blocks of uh, services and vested interests in, in the way the, the system currently runs. That's, I think, the reason why we haven't been able to shift as much to prevention. So I don't think looking towards the new tax powers as a way of kind of bringing some extra money that we could then put into prevention is the, necessarily the, the, the panacea here. I think it, it, we do need to look at our budgets uh, independently of, of the tax system there. But yes, you know, in terms of t how tax relates to it, the, there isn't an appetite within our sector as far as we can tell with all the caveats I mentioned earlier about how much we'd be able to generate debate on this towards reducing taxes. Again, those tough decisions on spending uh, to be made is, is an ongoing problem and not one that's easily resolved as, as, as you've highlighted. My final question comes um, back to a proposal which was made by uh, Ben Thompson, which was uh, interesting, if, if nothing else, which was that you'd have a, a cut in, uh, in SRIT, uh, but you'd have a big increase in council uh, taxation. So actually it would be a balance in terms of the overall funding received through taxation, but more of it would be raised at a lo local level. I wanted just to get the panel's view on that proposal, if, 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 if perhaps you'd seen the detail of that from, from last week's evidence. And in terms of, just, Richard, you've talked about in your uh, um, submission about the importance of explaining to people the value of, of taxation, why they're paying the taxes, what they're getting back from that. If there was that kind of switch or more of it's happening at a local level, do you think that would make that argument easier or would, be, would it be just as difficult to pursue? I think we, we gave evidence to the, the joint cause of the Scottish Government inquiry into local taxation and you know, one of the, the points really there is that uh, when, when it comes to local taxes, the current system really isn't really designed in that way where you can separate out the impact on those uh, more in poverty than others. It's, very, it's, very, it's even more blunt, if you like, than the, the powers that will be coming to the Parliament uh, next year. But I, but I suppose, you know, we have always argued, and we argued at the back of the Smith Commission with a lot of support uh, driven by our membership, that, you know, we would be keen to see a portfolio of taxes devolved to the Parliament rather than just, you know, uh, a lot on a very, very specific narrow tax base, which is what we're getting uh, um, in the, uh, the Scotland Act 2015. So a portfolio of taxes means that, yes, you can then start to kind of rebalance and, and look at how you tax people differently. But again, it goes back to what Stephen Boyd has, has, has mentioned in his response quite rightly, that you, know, you need to think about uh, the prog how progressive the tax is, how, where, where does the burden fall, and how do you make sure that the approach that you're taking with taxes works better? 
I mean, again, those countries that manage over time to sustain significantly higher total tax revenues tend to tax much more on a local basis. So I think there is something in what Ben's saying. I think if we do shift a, a far greater proportion of taxation responsibilities to the local level, yeah, and it does do more, I think, to... to to help people understand how these taxes have been spent. It should help increase the quality of local democracy as well. And I think we're all currently engaging with the uh, Commission uh, on Local Taxation. But it should help sustain uh, higher tax revenues in the longer term. I think the danger is trying to do this over one year in a very, very blunt fashion, which I think sounds positively dangerous. It's something I hadn't really thought through until this morning, but I think just to uh, whack a great sum off income tax collected in Scotland and just to shift that onto council tax raises all manner of questions, not least about how this tax is collected and how individuals and families cope with that transition. Clearly, if you're paying income tax, you're doing it through PAYE. People tend to find this an easier way to manage, I think, than paying council tax kind of monthly and having to, you know, arrange to do that themselves proactively. So I think there's all manner of issues there that you know, would require some pretty careful forethought. I think the suggestion that we should increase council tax as it currently is, as a means to addressing some of the issues that are prevalent in Scotland at the moment, is, is um, not one I would support. So we also modelled um, changes in council tax rates and the impact that would have on health inequalities and that would exacerbate health inequalities because it's such a regressive tax so you would have to do a massive amount of recycling of that additional resource to redistribute the income the additional income you might raise through it in order to mitigate what you would be doing by um, increasing that regressive tax um, I think the points that Stephen and, and here make around increasing the total tax take and improving local democracy are true but one other consequence of increasing local tax in this way is that we have some of the areas in Scotland with the highest local government taxation rates which already have the highest mortality rates and the highest rate of health problems so namely Glasgow and surrounding deprived areas in west central Scotland and so you put the demand for services and the payment of those services on the already most deprived and lowest income groups and this is a problem that Glasgow has suffered for some time whereby its local tax base is much diminished compared to the need that it serves within its city but also the needs that it meets for people coming in say to, to use its museums and such like so I think the local taxation um, versus local democracy issues a tricky one to resolve but certainly we wouldn't support an increase in council taxation as it currently is because of its regressive nature and the knock-on effect on it, gives it, gives it, it gives a different model in terms of its progressivity over it, you know as you put it being a regressive tax so it'd be interesting to see your, your modeling dr mccartney so we can compare the two yes it, it's all cited in the evidence i'm happily share more of that if that's thank it. you very much indeed jean to be followed by john uh, thank you, thank you. I wanted to, uh, it's been suggested that there might be um, people leaving Scotland if, they were, if the tax rate here was higher. And in each of your professions and the organisations that you represent, would, do you think that, that that's an issue? If Scotland were to have a higher rate of income tax than England, because we're constantly comparing ourselves with, with England, uh, in, in so many other fields, is that seriously something that, that you feel people would look at the, their pay slip? I mean, I could start with that self. So um, we, we based our modelling on, as I, I mentioned, the, this University of Stirling model of varying, variations in the, the various tax powers that were available to the Scottish Parliament. And one of the assumptions they made in that model was about the degree to which people might move in response to changes in the taxation. And uh, I mean, it's assumptions, but it's based on the international literature and the number of people moving at the kinds of magnitude of scale of uh, changes in taxation system that are being proposed and discussed today were minimal. Um, and certainly when you think about it, you know, I would be in that higher tax band my job would still exist. There are plenty of people looking for jobs. I think so many of those posts that are in the higher paid um, sector are not um, so mobile that people could take those jobs elsewhere. Clearly that would be different in some other sectors, but those sectors are much smaller in Scotland than they are, say, for the rest of the UK. 
I mean, I think it's an answer. Uh, it's a question that we can't really answer with any great certainty at this moment in time. I think we have to understand the starting point, which is, you know, a re quite a low rate of labour mobility within the UK compared to other jurisdictions such as America and Canada. This was something that came out of the independence referendum last year and the work particularly undertaken by the Bank of England to support Mark Carney's famous speech in February last year when he kind of attacked the myth of, you know, great labour mobility between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Although you would have to point out that far greater mobility from Scotland to the UK than there is from the UK to Scotland currently. I mean, we would certainly support in the longer term, once we have control over rates and thresholds, having a higher top rate of tax in Scotland. But I think you'd have to understand that it would be a policy experiment. You know, we would not be able to forecast a, or model the consequences of that change with any great certainty. I mean, the, the integrated market of the UK is kind of unique, you know, and now we can look at what happens in the States and Canada, other jurisdictions, but I mean, we will only know what it's going to do to labour mobility within the UK once it actually happens. Now, we think that, you know, it's not all about revenues when you talk about top rate of taxes, it changes behaviours as well, and if you want to create an economic model in Scotland that is distinct from the rest of the UK, I would argue a higher top rate of tax is absolutely crucial, a component of what that would be in changing behaviours of the executive class. So, I mean, the you know, the benefits and consequences may well be things that we haven't really thought through yet, you know, and I think it will be important just to, you know, take the odd policy experiment here and see how things work out, you know, understanding that if the impact is more detrimental than might have been forecast, then, we, you know, there might have to be some, uh, you know, quickly addressed in some way. I suppose with the third sector's constituency, we've got two constituencies here that we would highlight. One is the beneficiaries. Now, for many of the people that our sector works with as beneficiaries, I don't think they would have the choice whether to move or, or to stay. I think they would have to stay. They wouldn't have that choice to be able to move. Um, there's another constituency for our sector as well, which we've been highlighting this year, and that is the donor base. It's become something which, our sec uh, which charities have become very aware of uh, over the last few months, and the trust we have with our donors, those that give money to charitable causes. Now, if the systems were to diverge quite substantially and income tax in Scotland were to be very, very different from the rest of the UK, then clearly it might well become in the interest of some of the donors to charities to consider uh, particularly the system became very complicated for them uh, in this part of the UK. They might consider moving. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question whether they would or wouldn't, but uh, it would certainly, I could see a case for some of them thinking that, you know, if, if I can have a more coherent system, if I move to another part of the UK, if I can make sure all of my money goes to the good causes and so on, if I can deal with the complexity better there, then maybe I should move. So, um, again, a question rather than a, you know, a, you know, a certainty. Just to to continuing on that theme about I think all of you in, in each of, of the, the papers you've presented talk about education on, on tax and actually getting people to understand the tax system better. Um, and if we think back, um, and I was in the SNP at the time when we had Penny for Scotland, which uh, wasn't seen as, a, as a, a great idea, although, you know, clearly there would have been more money to, to, to spend uh, on uh, public services at that point. How do, how do you think that, that that can happen, that actually getting people... Do you think that money should be ring-fenced? I mean, governments don't like that, but, but is that something that you think would have public appeal uh, in terms of absolutely seeing how this... The, what, what the penny income tax, if it was a penny inc increase of 1%, 10% of the 10 pence um, would mean in real terms and how it might be divvied up would actually make that more appealing. I mean, I could offer a very limited comment on this, uh, and that's just to look at the Scot Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, which asks questions on people's appetite for further redistribution. And although the proportion of the population which support redistribution has come down over time, it's still substantially above 50%. And so although that doesn't specify particular policies or particular increases, um, there does seem to be a majority support for greater redistribution. It's also, you know, I think, um, widely accepted that the, the, the narrative um, adopted by a whole variety of, of people in the public arena around 
how we describe particular groups and their needs and you know the whole strivers versus shirkers debate the dis description of welfare recipients and people who require uh, different aspects of the social security system has often been quite divisive and has reduced the social solidarity and the universal approach to both providing services and universally all contributing to them and I think that we all have a responsibility in how we describe how we fund and uh, provide public services to enhance that social so solidarity lest we exacerbate inequalities and the basis for addressing inequalities in the future. Do you think that since the referendum, a lot of comparisons were made with, with uh, the, mostly the Nordic countries who are higher taxpayers generally, um, that there is actually a, a greater, that has given people a much greater awareness of what happens if you pay more tax. I mean, in a, in a sense, there's, there's been a, a, bit, a bit of a, an argument around that already. Um, even if it's just comparing, you know, the government saying that we can have Nordic public services without increasing tax, but taking that out of the equation, I, I think I think that that people have looked at that in a different kind of way. Would you agree with that? I think for me, sorry, I think for me, uh, part of the trouble here might be if we're looking at this in terms of you know. It, the tax that you're paying as a taxpayer, you know, how, how is this being spent and is, where is it going? I think that then starts to, to, to look quite strange and dour to those people that uh, maybe are not paying income taxes because they're out there below the threshold or maybe they're not, uh, they're, they're, they're depending on more support. I think it's, it's probably better to look at this from the perspective of the tax that government collects from all sources, whether it's through, uh, from, from corporations or through um, consumption taxes or through duties or whatever it might be, to look at tax in a whole and seeing how that is then spent and looking for people to buy into that rather than to, to personalise it to the extent of where is your penny that you're putting in going. Because then it, you start to only speak to a very particular section of society. Yes, sir. I'm not particularly confident that the referendum debate left us in a significantly better place to have this discussion than before. Uh, I think there were a number of narratives that arose during that uh, debate that were not particularly helpful, i.e. we could be more like the Nordics, but all we needed was more and better jobs rather than higher tax rates. I mean, Jerry and I were both involved with the Jimmy Reid Foundation, and Jerry will remember... Uh, lengthy email exchanges before we published a paper on taxation in which I was arguing strongly that that was uh, a risible approach, frankly, to funding public services on the basis of uh, a, a Nordic model. And I think it's also important that we don't get too dewy-eyed about what's happening in the Nordic arena at this moment in time. I mean, their higher tax systems have been under significant attack for a number of years now. And we've seen in Sweden in particular, the total tax revenues fall reasonably substantially over the last few years. So I think, generally speaking, you know, the, you know, the, certainly the scale and quality of political debate in Scotland has, you know, improved. I wouldn't make too much of that over the last few years. You know, so maybe we're in a better place in which to start generating a more mature discussion about taxation. But I don't think the referendum debate, in and of itself, left us in a hugely better place to have discussions specifically about taxation. Okay, thank I you. Say, along with uh, Jay McCartney, I addressed a public meeting in Elderslie in 2013. I don't remember taxation uh, playing a very big role in that debate. Just one, one thing I would just say for clarification, though, um, to what Jean Urquhart said, the SNP did actually specifically point out how that money would be spent in a ring fenced way on housing, education, and health. I don't think it necessarily made that much of a difference. If, uh, um, Tony Blair is government raised taxes through fiscal drag, excise duties, VAT, and national insurance gone up. In other words, he'd said that they would increase income tax, but other taxes were allowed to rise. And sometimes politicians, because the, the public don't feel it, perhaps, in the same way as income tax, it's almost a totem. They use these other methods, but of course we don't have some of these uh, uh, methods available to us here in Scotland. John, to be followed by Gavin. Hey, thanks, <coughs> convener. Um, I mean, I was quite impressed last week by uh, Lucy Hunter Blackburn. I don't know if you saw her paper or heard some of the things she was saying, but she gave us some figures uh, about what tax, you know, would actually be paid at different levels of salary. Mm. 
and I mean, she was arguing that um, it, SRIT is progressive, and I think that's been a wee bit of a uncertainty and a bit of debate. So, I mean, can I ask you guys, um, do you think SRIT is progressive? No, I, I don't think it's progressive in and of itself, but that's not to say that the funds that could be raised through increasing SRIT could not be used in progressive ways. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier on, I think we can use progressive and regressive in very narrow and simplistic form. So I've read Lucy's submission. I thought it was very good. It's a serious argument. And as I said, I mean, it's one that certainly informed discussion and debate at the STUC. It's one, you know, and again, a, and I have to stress that our position is on balance, you know, and on the basis of a very difficult trade-off. And if indeed the Scottish Government chose to run with Lucy's suggestion, then I mean that is something the STUC could entirely live with. I mean this is, you know, something again that we are, you know, for this specific year under discussion, we are making a recommendation. You know, we understand that there are other approaches and it's certainly not a dying the ditch position for us. So I think it's, you know, a reasonable case she makes, but I would have the fundamental point about whether or not SRIT is in and of itself progressive. I can't agree. I mean, I think it's clearly a, re a regressive instrument. Either of the others like to comment on that? Um, only tangentially, and that's to say that the reason that um, the income tax increase is modelled to have a positive impact in reducing health inequalities is because there's a non-linear relationship between income and health. So you have to increase incomes by quite a lot at the upper end of the scale to make a difference to health, but not by very much at the lower end of the scale. And therefore, small changes that improve the incomes at the lower end or um, will have a, a bigger impact there. So um, that's why it comes out as being progressive in terms of health inequalities. Um, I think the argument about whether SRIT itself is regressive or not depends a lot on how you measure it in relative terms, absolute terms. Stephen's right. Normally it's in relative terms, which is why it's normally um, a judge to be uh, regressive, but clearly it would take a greater amount of tax. And so in absolute terms, you could, you could argue it was. But the bigger prize clearly is to have greater adjustment in the bandings and other aspects of other taxes as well. So it's about what you do with the money uh, as well as how you collect it. But, I mean, clearly it's got progression built into it, which is what Lucy was highlighting last week. But the difference here is that the progression is what you're given. It's not something that you can uh, change or make more progressive or rebalance. And I think that's that's why uh, overall, you know, and, and plus the fact that this is, you know, just a very single, sim uh, blunt uh, instrument that you've been given, and you can't use policy. You can't use. You can't deploy policy decisions within the Scottish Parliament to change uh, the, the how it's balanced. I think that takes away the overall sense of progression. But yeah, of course, it's got uh, an element of progression built in. And you can and Lucy could quite easily provide those figures to show that element. That it's just a question of what you can actually do within the Scottish Parliament to change it. Because the figures she actually gave us were that if somebody went from 25,000 to 125,000, that is their salary increased five times, their, the actual tax, extra tax being paid went from 216 to 1875, which is about eight and a half times. So, I mean, on, on these pure figures, Stephen, you would accept that that is progressive. Sure, I follow those figures, but I mean, if, if the if the rate has been applied in a flat fashion to both to the basic additional and higher rates, I cannot see how that in and of itself again and understand you know understand that the revenues collected can be used in progressive ways and have progressive outcomes such as Jerry describes, but I don't understand how the instrument in and of itself can be described as progressive. I think her argument is that because of the ten thousand allowances at the bottom, somebody on fifteen thousand is not paying very much tax at all. Uh, whereas somebody on the uh, on the forty five percent rate, you know, every right, okay, under, every right, pound okay. they get, they'll be paying an extra forty five pence. Yeah, okay. I'd have to look at those. Yeah, okay, that's, that's fair enough. Okay. Um, I mean, I, t I take the point to one or two folk have mentioned that your comments are just for this year, and I accept that's what we're asking is just for this year. I'm just wondering about the time scales, though, because I mean, the power w this power we were given in two thousand and twelve, so that is taking four years to work its way through the HMRC's managed to change their systems, employers have got new software, all that kind of thing. Now, I don't know if we've got a time scale, but my assumption is that any new powers in the Scotland Bill will also take four years to work their way through. So that would be 2020. So 
should we wait till 2020 before we play around with taxes at all? Uh, or should we be thinking about it before then? In our submission, we should certainly be thinking about it before then. My understanding is we should hopefully receive the Smith Commission powers before 2020, but whether it be 2018, 2019, 2020, we should certainly look every year. Every year we should look at the case on its merits and certainly have a very close think about whether or not we need to increase or indeed to, you know, make the case for decreasing, which I wouldn't share, but have that discussion year on year. Absolutely. Again, would SCVO have a different view for the next four years, or is it pu are you purely talking this year? I think my understanding is that the reason why it was four years is because you know not only not only was it getting the systems in place or the infrastructure in place, but it was also uh, because the modelling had to be done so that when when we move into next year, you know, um, there they could be some conf confidence that uh, you know uh, the the correct kind of calculations could be applied. Now we, we won't clearly won't need to do that same kind of level of modelling again for the. Uh, the, the next phase because you know a lot, a lot of the the work the calculations that's already been done so my understanding is that you know it, it won't necessarily need to have the same kind of lead in but I'm, I'm not an expert on this so I don't know but certainly one of the things in parallel to all of the 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 building of the infrastructure and the modeling has been the discussions that are taking place and in Scotland there was a devolved tax collective that the Scottish government set up which did have representations from a range of uh, organizations including from the third sector and you know, a lot of the principles and discussions about how we might start with a tax system in Scotland including from a blank sheet of paper to to the credit of the the Scottish government they were open to that has been very very helpful and very very useful for us uh, uh, as third sector organizations to engage with now yes of course it hasn't been we haven't had the space and time even with the referendum to engage a much broader range of uh, people into the discussions as we would like but that discussion has already started I mean, I was interested in one of the things you said earlier, which was that obviously you're trying to help the most vulnerable people. Uh, now, presumably the most vulnerable people are not paying tax at all, really, or are not paying much tax. So this wouldn't actually have an effect on the people that you are helping or your organisations are helping. I think they, they have just as much of an interest in, in how the, their society is run and how it's paid for as anybody else. And of course, everyone pays taxes through the through the uh, the other taxes that are not up for SRIT, including VAT and, and other forms of taxation, and, and also local taxes and so on. So I think uh, one of the one of the, the the key points we would like to get across certainly is that just because you're not necessarily an income tax payer doesn't mean that you've got less of a stake in society or in the way in which uh, resources are deployed uh, within your country. And I think it's really important that we don't make that separation. So yes, people might be not paying a particular set of taxes because of uh, their particular set of circumstances, but they just have as, as much of a stake in society as any others, and they will certainly be paying taxes through other forms, whether it's through, you know, they might even see the, the rent that they're having to pay at extortionate rates as a, as a tax on, on, on the limited resources they have. So we need to look at this from a broader context, I think. Very much agree with that argument, which uh, has come across in some of the papers that we should look at the whole package. But obviously, at the moment, we're only looking at SRIT. But I mean, can I assume then that if, if SRIT was increased by a penny and we did target it at those who are more needy, let's say, then on the whole, the people that your organisations are helping would, be, would, net, would net benefit because on the whole, they would not be paying more tax, but they would be benefiting from the services. I, th I think we've said in, in, in our submission that you know if, if taxes were to be raised by uh, 1p in the pound, then, then clearly as long as it's spent in a way which does tackle poverty and inequalities, then uh, that would be something which uh, would definitely support the people that uh, our sector works with. Okay. And I mean, if I can go back to uh, yourself, S Stephen Boyd, um, I mean, I, I'm still struggling a wee bit to understand the STUC position because... You say, for example, taxes are not high by historical standards, um, and I take from that that therefore we've got a bit of space to to, to raise them. And also, you say, you've, you've, and you've said today, this is not the time to raise tax, but and yet this is the time when public sector finances are absolutely squeezed. Surely, this is the time to raise taxes to get more money. I mean, what I'm trying to describe, and I've said a, a number of times, it's a very difficult trade-off at this specific moment in time. Now, if you're having this discussion again in a year's time and the economy has continued to grow and the labour market has continued to stabilise, then absolutely, I think the point that you have just made about additional tax revenues being 
used to support the most vulnerable people in society is one we would absolutely support. Our judgment this year is that coming off the back of five years of historically unprecedented real wage falls, the recovery is still, you know, not particularly robust in a number of significant uncertainties. It may well even play out between this, uh, between now and when the tax is implemented in April next year. We think on balance now is not the time to raise SRIT. But again, I would stress if the Scottish Government do, as you seem to be implying you think they should, increase SRIT and use it in a way that uh, is uh, used to support the most vulnerable people in society. This is not something that you're going to find us in the papers screaming about. I mean, this is not, sometimes there are very clear dividing lines in taxation policy. Corporation tax would have been one. As you know, we vigorously opposed the Scottish Government's approach in that over a number of years. I think whether or not we should increase SRIT by 1 or 2p next year is an altogether different kind of debate. It's one where the dividing lines are much more blurred and we would certainly be much more accommodating dating to the Scottish Government changing their position on this than we were on an issue such as corporation tax. And is one of the factors in your attitude or your position, and I realise it's a, it's a kind of net effect of all your different members, but um, you know, does it make any difference if we said that that penny or tuppence was hypothecated or ring-fenced or something like that specifically for, say, I mean, say we put it all into um, mitigating welfare cuts or say we put it all into... GP practices locally in poorer areas. Would, would, would that kind of thing make a difference to your position or, or not really? I mean, it's something not discussed in the committee right. structure of the STUC, but I mean, I think, you know, amongst the people we represent, then it probably would. I mean, I think we all know the more technocratic arguments about why tax hypothecation is not necessarily a good idea, but I think in selling that increase at this particular juncture in economic history, then it's probably not unhelpful to do it in that way. Okay. We come yes, back on that point. I, I'm, I would be very, very concerned with that approach because, in in one sense, it, it would be seen as well. You know, we, we, we're, we've we've covered, we've we've managed to like cover and uh, sort out the welfare uh, mitigation side of things because look, we're taking this one p and we're using that to uh, mitigate it. And what about the rest of the budget? So, you know, I I, I think you know, I would be concerned about trying to. Um, you know, ring fence and try and say that's the bit which will sort out welfare and, and that means we don't need to worry too much about, you know, the rest of the budget and how we might use that for uh, uh, tackling poverty and inequalities. I wasn't reading your question as implying that at all. And if I had <laughs> okay, been, then I would agree with okay that, that, that's great. I mean, I appreciate all your comments. I mean, if I can just come back, uh, Mr Shah, uh, because one of the things you'd said before, if I can just find it, maybe we note, yeah, when we're talking about prevention, that was Richard Baker was raising that and I think you were kind of making a distinction between, well, it's how we spend the money at the moment and maybe we should spend, for example, less on acute services and more on preventative. But, but surely if we had a bit of extra money, that would actually take that pressure away because this disinvestment thing and taking it away from the acute services is very, very difficult, uh, for example, in health. So, I mean, if we could raise a, money, a bit of money and put that into preventative, would you be happier with that? I, I think what would happen is that you know we would get in a situation where we raised a bit more money through the income tax, and we would be back we would be back here in a year's time discussing the very same thing. If we could only raise a bit more, we might be able to then put it in prevention because because the acute services will swallow up whatever resources you you put in overall through the tax base. I really think uh, it would be very difficult to try and hive out for the same reason I gave in the previous point to try and say this this bit of extra money is for prevention. It, it kind of makes it sound like, you know, it's a luxury. Doing prevention is a luxury. It's not a luxury. It's absolutely essential. And it needs to be the whole budget, the whole uh, resource that's looked at, not just any addi additional extra that's done there. So I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that point, no. Okay, thanks. And finally, really, Dr. McCartney, I mean, you, you do give a reason why wh what we should do with the money if we were to raise more money. And, for example, you say increase the incomes of the lowest income groups, fund high-quality universal services brackets with proportionate universalism. Um, I mean, if we said that to the public, that would be quite kind of wide, really. Do you, do you think we can sell that kind of argument, let's raise income tax two pence f for that, or do you think we need to be more specific and say, well, let's put a, this chunk into, say, GP services in the deep end practices or, or something like that? Um, I mean, how this is sold to the public isn't my area of expertise, and so I don't want to be drawn too much on that. I, I would like to make two points in relation to what colleagues have said. I mean, first of all, in relation to welfare cuts and social security benefits, we know what's coming down the track for the next five years, or we know 
at least what's coming down the track and there may be more to be announced from the UK government and the incomes of many of um, our Scottish citizens who are reliant on social security payments, who are on the lowest incomes, lone parents particularly, young men being sanctioned off of JSA, are going to be plunged into absolute poverty over the next five years as that policy winds its way through the system. And the question about whether we do something now or whether we wait, and you put up the prospect about, you know, it might not be 2020 before we have more powers around this. I think if we continue to wait and not use those powers that are available to us, we do run the risk that things will be an awful lot worse by the time we get around to discussing what we might do with more powers. And I would just support the point that Rishir made earlier on about prevention. It doesn't need to be um, a cost to the Scottish Government to do prevention. Most of the effective things that you do around prevention are about regulation and legislation and don't actually cost an awful lot of money to implement. It's more simply you know, the cost of implementation rather than some revenue stream to employ staff to do X, Y and Z. So a lot of the effective means of prevention are available to the Parliament at the moment, but those options aren't being taken up. I mean, if I can just follow up on that, I mean, something like the family nurse partnerships are, are often an example of preventive spend, but I mean, that would require money to be put into that, would, would it not? But there are other aspects around, say, the regulation of food or um, for the regulation of alcohol sales. Right, okay. I mean, what's perhaps unknown is that in, in the USA and Canada, many off-trade um, premises for alcohol sales are actually owned and run by the, the state jurisdictions and that reduces the marketing of alcohol, it reduces the availability of alcohol and reduces the mortality of alcohol. There was a very high quality systematic review done by Han et al that showed that very clearly as different states nationalised and then privatised its off-trade licensing, it had a huge difference in alcohol deaths and so that doesn't cost an awful lot of money, it's kind of revenue neutral. Um, these things are available now. Very much. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, John. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by Jackie. Okay, very thank you. Um, right, I'll start with the NHS Scotland submission. Um, you talked about the impact of a, of a 1p increase in tax. Just to be clear, did, did you only measure the impact of a 1p increase in tax? Yeah. That's the only modelling that was available to us. At the time. Okay, um, you're looking to do more yes. for, for next year or so on. Um, okay, so you don't have any other figures, but just from what you do know, if, if you increase 1p to 2p, would you expect it to double? Would you expect it to increase or is it just impossible to say without looking at modelling? It would likely um, make further reductions to health inequalities. I couldn't quantify exactly how much. It's impossible to say unless you look to the yeah, modelling. And that's something we'll, we will look at doing. And indeed, we'll, we'll look at some of the other powers that will be coming to the Scottish Parliament in due course and try and model some aspects of that. OK, fair enough. Thank you. Um, STUC submission... Again, you've answered some questions about this, this comprehensive statement on tax policy, which you would like the government to do. You've outlined, I guess, that it's more about an approach as opposed to exact figures. What sort of time frame, though, would you expect? The, if the government were to follow your advice and your submission, what sort of time frame would you think is reasonable for them to go forward? Should it be the duration of a parliament, for example? Should it be uh, 10 years? Should it be three years? Do you have a, do you have a sort of view on the sort of time frame um, I hadn't necessarily been thinking in terms of time frames. It was more just a, an approach to the tax powers that we know are going to be forthcoming. So a kind of how you would start to... I don't know how you would start to... I mean, the Scottish Government has said very clearly that tackling inequality is its overriding concern in this Parliament, which we absolutely concur with. So knowing that you're having you're going to receive significant new tax powers how would you begin to wield what would your approach to taxation be when inequality is your overriding concern what kind of things would you be looking at how how would you begin to plan your taxation framework in the longer term so i hadn't really been thinking in terms of time frames but i would say the next couple of parliaments would probably be more appropriate well, that's helpful. And uh, last question is just uh, the SCVO submission. Um, the submission sort of laid the groundwork for a tax increase, and then it explained how it would spend additional money, but it didn't, uh, you know, suggest a tax increase. So I'm just keen to explore um, why it didn't. Is it a case that you didn't get an opportunity to, to speak to enough members to form a view, or is it the case that you spoke to a lot of members and the view was? Uh, mixed some wanted an increase or some didn't or was it a case of the members said they didn't want an increase i'm just keen to explore why you why you didn't ultimately reach a view 
It's interesting you say that it lays the groundwork. I mean, I suppose I, c I can see why you might think that because we, we, we said that, you know, from the conversations that we were able to have with the, uh, formally with our policy committee in Third Sector Forum and other arenas, um, there wasn't really an appetite for reducing taxes during a time of austerity. So that then suggests that the only way is up. So I can see why you might say that. But the, at the same time, there wasn't a view, very strong view expressed uh, uh, collegiately around uh, increasing taxes either. I mean, I think the, the, the concerns would be, you know, you could increase tax, but if that increase in tax is just there to offset a, a reduction in tax, let's say for business rates or something else or some other area w within which uh, Scottish Parliament has competence, then clearly that's not going to work. So the view, the view that we were able to collect was that if there is to be any tax increases, then, you know, this is how it should be spent. Now, we would apply the same principle to a majority of the rest of the, the budget that's available to the, the, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't kind of uh, try uh, read into it that this means that we're basically trying to prepare the ground for tax increases. Um, we haven't really expressed a view on that. Good enough, fair enough. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jack. To be followed by Mark. Um, I'll be very brief, convener, because a lot of it has already been covered by colleagues. But, but I wanted just to touch on, on the point made by Stephen Boyd, because um, what you're saying in the SUC submission is, you know, progressive um, income tax doesn't actually get you there to tackling inequality. It's a much wider discussion um, about taxes in general that will reduce inequality. Given that we would expect any government to set out its approach, what pointers do we have so far as to the Scottish Government's approach to taxation that would lead us to conclusions about the future? And I wonder whether you'd make some observations on that. Yeah, I mean, first thing I would say about progressive income tax would be a very central component of the kind of taxation framework we're looking at, so we're not saying that's not an issue. Uh, I think we have, I mean, we enjoy a very comprehensive and constructive dialogue, ongoing dialogue with Scottish Government ministers and officials almost on a daily basis about how we develop the Scottish economy in the interests of all our citizens. Now, we agree about an awful lot of things, but we have very often disagreed on issues around about tax. As you know, corporation tax, we've had a very public spat about that. We would be concerned in the... Uh, in the area of taxation about a number of signs we've had from Scottish Government ministers over the years. Corporation tax would be one, albeit the current economic strategy has reined back significantly on that position. The various mechanisms we discussed earlier on in the, the sessions, uh, the small business bonus, here, passenger duty, etc. And there has been a, an ongoing stream of suggestions about ways taxation could be cut on the basis of assumed incentive effects that we don't believe will materialise, which is why we, we don't support them. Uh, and a, a number of things were said. I, mean, I think you have to acknowledge that the referendum campaign was different times. I mean, it was a campaign, but a number of things were said during the campaign about taxation rates in Scotland not rising under independence that I think we are unhelpful to a longer-term mature debate about Scotland's taxation needs now. Whether or not ministers two or three years hence are prepared to have a very different kind of debate, I'm not entirely sure. But I think that kind of constant refrain about we could achieve Scandinavian levels of equality on the basis of total tax revenues in Scotland not increasing, I think, was unhelpful to the kind of debate we would want to generate. Tax revenues being cut, though? Um, was actually the case because when I look at the examples you give and what we know, um, it was about reducing the tax base by particularly reducing taxes to businesses. Would that not be a fair comment? I think I think I've already, through the course of my evidence, made that point. I think. Yeah. Fine, thank you. Um, the question here seems to be now whether to to increase now or to wait, and I think the STU's posi STUC's position is to judge year by year. Um, I'm kind of curious because I think Rashia makes a very good point. The amount of yield you would get from one pence on the income tax in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax is actually quite small. Um, so what kind of effects do you think this would have um, in quantum terms? And is there not a better argument to be had about shifting the spend within the overall budget, which is substantially higher? And I put that to you all. I mean, do you want me to start? Um, the Yes, it's a small change, um, but it's one of the few changes that are available, if you like. And I think we've all discussed how we'd like to have a different conversation when we have a, a larger range of options on the table, and hopefully we'll, we'll do that uh, in the future. 
Um, but I think there's um, small changes are important. That's still people's lives that can be affected, both in terms of their health outcomes and when they'll die, but also in terms of the money in their pocket and their quality of life. So um, small changes matter because lots of small changes add up to, to big changes. But yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to have a, a wider conversation. In terms of how the money is spent, um, we would encourage a shift towards preventative spending and we could have a further debate about what that means and, and what isn't preventative around the system. Um, there are mechanisms within the health sector already to try and minimise ineffective spending. So you'll be aware of things like the SIGN guidelines, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network, which um, try to reduce spending on ineffective medicines, drugs, and new health technologies, often marketed by pharmaceutical agencies, to try and get a revenue stream from the NHS, which may not actually be that effective. And we always need to guard against the demand for ineffective treatments and, and um, ineffective um, interventions. We've also got a very strong position within NHS Health Scotland of ensuring that robust evaluation is built in at the start of any innovative policy. And so we too often blunder into uh, a policy announcement on uh, an intervention that sounds good, but in truth we don't know whether it'll be effective or not. It's um, implemented in a way that there are no there's no randomisation, there's no robust control groups, and by the end of the intervention we're none the wiser about whether or not it was effective, and we need to stop doing that. And I would encourage all policymakers and politicians to be more honest in the sense of saying, sometimes we don't know what works, and we're willing to experiment here, and we'll tell you in five years whether or not this did work, and we'll tell you because we've implemented in a way to allow that. But if people nail their colours to the mast and say, this is going to be our policy and it will be effective, that creates an awful lot of disincentives to evaluate it robustly and find out whether or not it did actually work. And so where we are trying to move towards prevention, let's build in that evaluation from the start and learn what works, disinvest in what doesn't work, and then use that money to try other things. There's been a, a theme during this particular evidence session of whether we could hypothecate any increase in the SRIT towards specific uh, um, ambitions, whether it be prevention, tackling inequalities, welfare, and so on. And I think, you know, I would agree with uh, what uh, you've said, Ms. Bailey, that uh, uh, we have to look at the whole budget. We have to look at um, what is our strategy for tackling inequalities, shifting to prevention, tackling poverty, and so on through the whole budget and then look at whether raising uh, taxes through the SRIT, how that plays, a, how that contributes to that wider aim, wider objective. And I think it's really important we don't just hive off this 1P as a completely separate resource that we can do something completely separately with. It needs to be coherent and consistent with the rest of the budget as well. I think what is important to remember, I mean, I think you, the, the yield is small, but it's not insignificant. The macroeconomic impact of that tax rise in Scotland is likely to be similarly small, but perhaps not insignificant. And the environment in which that rise will be introduced in April next year, we do not yet know. Now, I've already ran through a number of reasons about why we are concerned about what the recovery might look like at that moment in time. <coughs> uh, and I think we sometimes forget, I mean, austerity is shorthand for fiscal consolidation. Fiscal consolidation has got two components, it's got spending cuts, but tax rises as well. When a tax rise across the border next year is a form of austerity. Now, introducing that additional austerity after the Chancellor has announced his potentially swinge in additional austerity on the 25th of November, an economy that we, in a labour market, we still think is significantly weaker than the headline data tends to suggest is problematic. Now, again, I suggest, you know, if that increase is forthcoming and if that money is spent well, we look forward to listening to that case. But the macroeconomic consequences shouldn't be overlooked this year. Thank you. Thank you. The late Mark McDonald. Uh, yes, and uh, apologies, convener, for the uh, lateness of my arrival this morning. Uh, no disrespect was meant to yourself or to the witnesses. Um, <coughs> so f forgive me that, that there may be a potential that what I ask has already been asked in the sort of 15 minutes that I missed before I arrived. So uh, if it has, then this will be a very short uh, question session. I wonder if you would agree that some of the, the difficulty that might be created um, as a result of what you've all described as a sort of inflexibility of, of SRIT, although there are some arguments about 
changes you could make. But I think the, the certainly from the STUC perspective is that there's a difficulty around making changes because those changes apply across the board. Is that we run the risk of uh, a sort of stilted debate occurring in the lead up to what we anticipate being more substantial powers coming as a result of Smith. And it makes it more difficult then for uh, sort of not necessarily radical, but even just changes to be proposed because we've come into this sort of Scottish rate of tax and the view being held out there that it won't really alter that much. I, th I think that is a concern. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, it's something we did try to cover in our written evidence that, you know, although we are proposing no change this year, I mean, we hope that a robust debate will happen year on year about what should happen to SR SRIT. So as long as it's the only mechanism we have, we hope there is a thorough debate every year about how it should be wielded. You know, I think there is a danger that, yes, we just leave it sitting there until the Smith Commission powers are forthcoming. And I think it, well, it's incumbent on all of us in the organisations we represent to ensure that that doesn't happen. I don't know anything else to add. I mean, uh, briefly, um, I, th I think a, a frustration of um, organisations such as my own who are trying to do what we can to reduce health inequalities is that we seem to be postponing action um, frequently and, and um, we know that there are difficulties with the powers we have, but there are things that we could do to better redistribute income at the moment both around SRIT and what you might do with the, the revenues from that, but also around local government taxation. And, um, you know, there's an urgent problem here. Health inequalities are wider than um, the rest of Western and Central Europe. And that's not a good place to be in, given the, the human consequences that it, have, it has. And, I mean, it, it's also worth just saying that that human consequence also knocks onto the economy. You know, the, the lost working days and the, the loss to the economy of of all of that additional morbidity is substantial. And so by not acting um, and not using the powers we do have, uh, that has a consequence. But um, clearly the, the promise of a more nuanced um, set of uh, poli uh, policy options would, you know, does kind of tend to put it onto the never never. I think what I, what I mentioned earlier um, was that uh, you know, what next year does offer is, is a spotlight on tax because this is a new tax, uh, a very you know significant new tax uh, in terms of it, symbolically at least, and, and it, it has got the opportunity to offer a spotlight and improve and uh, encourage discussion with a much wider range of people than might have normally taken an interest in tax in Scotland. So that's the opportunity next year. Now, clearly, um, whether there's no change or if there is some minor change, I, I can't imagine there'll be any significant radical major change. I, I only imagine there'll be something like 1p if there is a change. Um, this, there is plenty of opportunity to lay, lay the groundwork for a discussion, a debate with a much wider range of people because for the first time we will be thinking about um, an income taxes in Scotland. Um, I mean... Not relating to us, I mean, we've had some submissions which have spoken about reducing um, SRIT. And um, while Ben Thompson was here before us last week, I think Scottish Retail Consortium have also suggested that a reduction would bring a wider benefit around, for example, a boost to VAT through consumer spending. Now, we can argue the, the whys and wherefores of that, but I wonder if one of the, one of the, the, the difficulties that's created in, the, in terms of the completeness element is that if you don't have access to all of the other taxation elements, if there was that corresponding benefit, it wouldn't necessarily be felt in terms of the budget that was available to the Scottish Government. And that's one of the difficult challenges the Scottish Government's going to have to weigh up when it comes to what it decides to do with SRIT. I'm seeing general nods of the head. I don't know if anybody wants to expand beyond that or... Not really, I mean, uh, yes, that, and that's entirely true. It, would, it, it creates a difficulty where you've got aspects of um, devolution and, and you don't have a joined-up picture and it's going to cause some uncertainty about you know, where revenues might appear, whether they appear through VAT or whether they appear through you know, growth in some other sectors. So um, I can understand that uncertainty and um, nervousness around it. And, and if we had a very comprehensive set of arrangements in front of us to discuss, or if we could start from scratch, as Rashir um, previously talked about, we might have a more informed discussion around what the best options might be, but we're necessarily constrained, I guess. Some of our members uh, 
<coughs> when we were kind of uh, you know responding and and thinking around the Smith Commission, uh, did kind of debate quite openly with us, you know, the, the possibility, and it was quite a strong point that you know uh, it could actually be better. It could have actually been better if if a portfolio of taxes right across the different ranges of tax options was up for devolution rather than. Uh, you know, a, a very full income tax uh, pr proposition. So that even if it was, even if a portfolio of taxes meant only partial income tax devolution, much more partial than what's currently being debated in the Scotland Act, because it would be ba balanceable with other taxes in, across a portfolio of taxes, that could actually have been even a better option for policy design in Scotland than what is currently being mooted around uh, much more fuller income tax powers for the 2015 Act. Repeat the point I made earlier that when you cut taxes, you can be sure of the detriment in terms of lost revenues. Any potential economic benefits are highly uncertain and may not materialise at all. I mean, I would refer you a very interesting example recently. I'm not pretending Scotland is a perfect analogue for Kansas, but in 2012, Governor Sam Brownback slashed state income taxes on the basis that the incentive effects would be dramatic, economic activity would flow rapidly to Kansas, and the economy would soar. Well, of course, the opposite's happened. The economy has grown no quicker than anywhere else. In fact, there's a, a lot of evidence that it's been significantly slower. The state finances are in an utter mess. Um, the state government, uh, the state um, Supreme Court recently ruled that education no longer, the quality of education no longer fulfilled uh, the governor's responsibility to provide an adequate education. So again, the revenues fell off dramatically and quickly. Uh, the impact on the quality of public services was felt almost immediately and we're still waiting for the supposed magical incentive effects to materialise. I would hope I could say we're a long way from Kansas. So, um, in terms of in terms of uh, in in terms of the behavioural uh, impacts, um, I wonder if and, and it kind of ties into the completeness element about this is uh, there's been much said about relocation uh, of individuals as a consequence of this and whether that would happen. Is is the more material risk not around issues like deferred income or moving? To, towards dividend income where, uh, for example, on dividend income, while there is still a tax to be paid, it's not going to be paid in Scotland um, necessarily. So uh, is that the more material risk that, that would have to be weighed up when you look at for particularly the higher rate pairs um, with any increase under SRIT? That's a legitimate concern. Uh, and I also think under SRIT, it's very difficult to envisage circumstances where you know increases in SRIT are going to materially affect labour mobility. I just don't really see it now. I think it will be much more of a discussion when we assume full control over rates and thresholds. And if, as I would argue, we need a significantly higher top rate of tax and a lower threshold, then yes, there should be a discussion about what this might mean in terms of labour mobility. But I think it's kind of a false issue around about SRIT. I don't think if we stuck 2P on SRIT, you're going to see a flow of executives suddenly from Scotland to the rest of the UK. I can't really see it happening. I thought it was interesting that the Scottish Retail Consortium were one who were arguing that that effect was likely to, uh, uh, to ensue. I mean, I don't think that paying that sector is such that it's really going to affect the decisions of executives about where to, or even senior management, where to locate, which of course rely on a number of things, not just the rate of taxation, relies heavily on the quality of public services, quality of life, etc. So, I mean, I, I just can't really see it being an issue under SRIT. Mm -hmm. Any, <coughs> anything, sorry, uh, no. I think Stephen's covered that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's concluded the committee's question. I'm just wondering if witnesses have any further points they want to make to committee before we wind up the session? Anything that maybe not been covered that you want to say? issues, particularly around about the progressivity, stroke regressivity of uh, various tax systems that we've done some work on, I'd be happy to send you, and I said I would forward the work we've done on the small business bonus as well. Uh, yes, that would be very helpful. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much for answering our, our questions so comprehensively. I'm now going to call a five-minute uh, recess in order to give members a natural break and allow for a change of our witnesses.
So I'm going to reconvene the session. Our next piece of business is to take evidence from the Minister for Sport, Health, Improvement and Mental Health as part of our continued scrutiny of the Care of Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. Uh, Mr Hepburn is joined today by Scottish Government officials, Dr Maureen Bruce, Maura Oliphant and Victoria Macdonald. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Minister to make an opening statement. That's thank, thank you, Vina. I don't particularly have an opening statement. I'm happy to move uh, straight to questions. OK, that's fine. Want. That's OK. Well, I mean, obviously, I've been a, a, a member of this committee for a considerable period of time. You know that I'll start off with some questions. I'll try not to ask all the nice, juicy questions so that my colleagues can actually uh, have a go. <laughs> I'm going to lynch me during the during the break there, so I'll, uh, I'll just kick off and we'll see how it goes from there. Okay. Um, in terms of um, the recommendations uh, from the report on Care of Scotland Bill's financial memorandum, in paragraph 88 we said, and I quote, the Scottish Government has indicated it would intend to bring forward a supplementary financial memorandum to address the cost of any amendments at Stage 2. The committees have the view that sufficient time must be allowed between Stage 2 and 3 of the Bill to allow proper scrutiny of, sub of a supplementary FM, including time for the committee to seek evidence from stakeholders in the Scottish Government. So how much time uh, are we likely to get between Stage 2 and 3, Minister? Um, time between Stage 2 and 3? The, currently, the timetable I understand is we'll have stage one uh, in, uh, in early November, so we'll move to stage two pretty promptly uh, thereafter. And uh, I think stage three is likely to be some point in December or uh, January thereafter. Convener. Okay, so do you feel that that allows sufficient time? Uh, I certainly hope so. Of course, the requirement uh, that I understood that you'd uh, requested was sufficient time to assess any a supplementary financial memorandum. I was clear, of course, that we'd only provide a supplementary financial memorandum in the circumstances that anything we put in the face of the bill necessitated such. Uh, and in my uh, letter to you, uh, I don't think we're in uh, that territory. OK. Now, you, you talk about um, you're going to propose relatively minor amendments at stage which ensure the way forward on the waiving of charges could be delivered through regulations in due course. That's a, that's a bit kind of woolly. How, what kind of time scale are we talking about there? In terms of... Uh, when the regulations would mm -hmm. be enforced. Yeah. Well, of course, the provisions of this bill uh, would come into effect for financial year 2017-18, uh, and I think we'd have enough time uh, between the uh, the bill being passed uh, at this Parliament, uh, getting royal assent, to try and have them in place more or less for the same time as the uh, the implementation of the the bill the, when the bill starts. Okay. Now. Uh, you, you talk about in your in your, your letter to us in the, the, about the carers bill fin finance group, which is uh, met for the first time in July, and you say that uh, this will further explore the assumptions behind the financial memorandum and consider any new evidence which might be available. Will this feed into a supplementary financial memorandum? Yes, I mean having made the point that we don't envisage there being a, a necessity for, and if it did emerge that there was. A, such a requirement, of course, we would provide such. I still stand by the financial memorandum uh, that we provided. I think it's based on uh, the best available information uh, that was uh, that we we had. Um, of course, there have been some uh, remarks made by other uh, stakeholders, and that's why we set up the finance group. But I'm not aware of any evidence having emerged thus far that would cause me to question the initial financial memorandum. Yes, I know you say you, you consider the financial memorandum to be robust based on the, uh, the available evidence, although the committee did express a number of concerns, as we've obviously reported. But there's a separate issue uh, in the role of finance group in recommending an appropriate method of distributing funding to local authorities, NHS boards and third sector. Um, and again, um, you talk about having a role in terms of establishing procedures for monitoring demand, costs and achievements against the bill's objectives uh, on a longer time scale. Again, you know, what time scale are we talking about? I mean, the, the issue we have here is that it's quite difficult to pin down a lot of these things, you know? I mean, you know, in due course, mm -hmm. longer time scale. We're not really getting anything kind of well, concrete here. Can we, I suppose the, the, the group has uh, uh, two roles here. It's to help us inform us as the bill proceeds, and that's clearly imminent. We need to get that uh, any information it wants to provide us uh, as soon as possible. Um, but there's a, a slightly longer term role, and I know that one of the things that this... Uh, committee uh, has expressed uh, interest in is uh, the government always reviewing the, the legislation it passes. So this group is there to help inform uh, that type of process. So that that's a slightly longer term uh, piece of work. 
Okay, I'm going to open it out to, to colleagues around the table straight away. Jackie? Yeah. I wonder whether I could pursue this question of whether there's going to be a supplementary financial memorandum. Um, you seem clear in your response to the convener that there wouldn't be one at stage two because there are very limited amendments. Are we going to get one at all at any stage? It, at this stage, I don't envisage one, uh, Ms Bailey, but I suppose the point I'd make to the convener, and having been a member of this committee, I uh, recognise the absolute requirement for it to uh, scrutinise uh, 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 every uh, item of government expenditure if uh, the mayors that there was one necessary, and of course we would provide it. So you're saying if the committee recommended that, you would then provide it, uh, which no, they've I'm, already done? No, uh, I'm suggesting that if it emerged as a necessity, which uh, I don't think it has thus far, we would provide one. Would, would you not accept that there is no procedure at all for anything like a financial memorandum at the stage that you would be introducing regulations? I would accept that, and that's why we said we would provide any financial information on the face of the policy note. But of course, I'm also very willing to keep this committee up to speed as we progress. But by definition, with secondary legislation, there is a lower level of scrutiny. And although you've moved from a negative to an affirmative instrument, that is still considerably less scrutiny than would happen with primary legislation. Is well, that not the case? I, I would uh, suggest that's uh, in the hands of the committees of uh, the Parliament. If they want to uh, exercise rigorous scrutiny function on any statutory instrument, then they're able to do that. And uh, I think it's an important change to move from a negative to an affirmative instrument. And that's primarily the reason why we've done that, because I recognise absolutely that Parliament has to have the ultimate say in uh, moving forward. Yes, but the Parliament also sets out quite clear procedures in relation to financial memorandums that should be before committees with primary legislation. And I think that, in essence, is, is the problem. Um, have you made any estimate, because I'm being told that it could be tens of millions of pounds worth um, of spending that was simply going to slip through under secondary legislation? What estimates have you made of the total cost? Well, let me be clear, we were not seeking to slip anything uh, through here. We were seeking to be as uh, clear as we can. Uh, this is uh, a complicated matter, and to be uh, candid with the committee, we're, we're not quite there yet. We're still discussing this matter uh, with COSLA, so uh, that uh, is ongoing, but I, I commit to keeping this committee informed as, that, uh, as we uh, move forward. Is it not the case that there's actually a difference of opinion between yourselves and COSLA about some of the unit costs used? Uh, well, we, yes, we've explored that, uh, obviously, at uh, stage one. Um, I would go back to the point I've made, I think, on the available information that we have, the estimates that we have set out in our financial memorandum are robust. Uh, I uh, made the point uh, the last time I was at this committee, speaking to the financial memorandum, that uh, I very much welcome uh, any different methodology that other partners, including COSLA, might like to, to set out. Uh, I think I'm still right in saying thus far we've not uh, received as such, but nonetheless we've set out the the finance group to, to work through uh, these issues, but uh, I stand by the financial memorandum we presented. But it is the case that stakeholders have said that they, in their view there will be enhanced costs. Is there not a danger that in setting out an ambitious policy by not following it up with adequate finance, you're in danger of disappointing people about its implementation? Well, I would certainly agree that uh, this is uh, an ambitious piece of legislation. I think it's an area we need to be uh, ambitious on. I'm sure you would agree with that, uh, Ms Bailey. I'm sure you have many carers within your constituency who uh, find life difficult, and I think we can do more to support uh, them. Uh, I uh, stand by the financial memorandum we have presented, and of course it's the, uh, the case that we would uh, all seek to finance any legislative mechanism we take forward through this Parliament. Finally, convener, I, I wasn't quite clear that I got... Um, information from you when the convener asked about regulations in due course. When is that anticipated to be? I would uh, hope we could put them in place to uh, have the uh, statute effect at the same time as the bill had statute effect. Which is when? It would start 2017-18. Okay, thank you, convener. Okay. Any further questions from committee members? Gavin. Um, convener, thank you. Um, Minister, you stand by this financial memorandum Okay. How is the cost of replacement care dealt with in that memorandum? Well, I think we were clear that at that stage we hadn't uh, come up with the appropriate mechanism to uh, provide that information. And I'm being perfectly clear, perfectly clear at the time of presenting the financial memorandum, I'm being perfectly clear with the committee uh, in that respect. Now that is uh, an ongoing matter and it's one that I uh, 
not only I'm happy to uh, keep the committee up to speed with, but I would expect the committee would want me to keep them up to speed with, and I commit to doing that. Okay. So it's not, there's no figure in your view for replacement care in the financial memorandum? Are we uh, from my memory, I'm looking to my officials to correct me if I'm wrong, and I think we're pretty clear that, that there wasn't at that time. Okay. Subsequent to that, though, the bill team gave evidence and said to this committee, on the record, that the cost of replacement care on current prices would be in the region of £30 million. We asked why that wasn't in the financial memorandum, uh, and we were told that we, it wasn't in the memorandum because they'd worked the £30 million figure out after the memorandum was published. So the Scottish Government is saying to us there could be a cost of £30 million on top of the financial memorandum, yet you are saying there is no need for any additional information in terms of memorandum? Well, I, I, I'm, I, I don't think I'm saying there's, there's no need, and I, as a former member of this committee, I would recognise the uh, importance of assessing uh, any uh, uh, financial commitment this government seeks to make. I suppose the point I would make, uh, Mr Brown, is that we haven't uh, as yet defined what the mechanism will be, and without having defined what the mechanism will be, we can't say definitively what it will cost. What I can say is uh, I do not think it will be anything approaching £30 million. Pounds. Well, how can you say that then? What, what will it be? Uh, we haven't defined it to, uh, ultimately. Um, I uh, am happy to come back to the committee once we finesse that further, but what I can say is it will not be £30 million. Pounds. Okay. The problem is, you've said this before, Minister, if I quote directly from the official report of the 3rd of June, you said to me, having committed to come back to you in writing to clearly establish whether the £30 million is an annual figure, I will commit to providing a further breakdown of what it relates to, if the committee will find that useful. That's a direct quote from the 3rd of June. Can you now tell us, is it an annual figure? and why you haven't come back to us to tell us how it was broken down. Having said it won't cost £30 million, I can tell you it won't be an annual figure. Um, if you feel we haven't provided you with uh, the requisite information, uh, then I'm, I'm happy to, for us to look at that and come back to you. And I apologise if we've not done that. Well, what do you mean, if you've not done that? I mean, it, I've read out what you said. Do, do you feel you have given us a breakdown? Uh, I, if you're telling me you don't feel we have, then I, I'm willing to concede we can uh, look to provide you with further information. I think that would be really important. Okay. The reason I'm pressing this is it's a potentially biggest slice, biggest sure. single slice of the whole expenditure. Yeah. And for, for a memorandum not to have it, I think, is a big mistake. Yeah. For you not to have corrected that mistake, I mean, clearly there are going to be uh, costs for care, right? You might not think it's £30 million, pounds, but there are going to be costs. Whether those costs are borne by the government or by local government or by individuals, they're going to be borne by someone. And in terms of standing orders, you as a government have to say to us what you think the costs will be and which of those three categories will bear it. So however um, the waiving of charges issue is resolved, if there's going to be uh, the number of carers getting respite, as we all want to see, there's going to be a cost, right? The cost will be uh, large. The only thing you're arguing about is who, how it will be broken down, who will pay for it. But regardless of who pays for it, it should all be clearly in front of the financial memorandum. Well, uh, I uh, take your perspective. What I, uh, am, what I am clear on is that we can only cost uh, things that we have uh, definitively set out how we'll take the matter forward. Now, that's where we're, we're working, and I've already been clear and quite candid and not trying to hide anything from the committee that we are still talking to COSLA about the costs related to this matter, and we're not quite there yet. But my commitment is to inform this committee is quickly and as promptly as we can in that matter. Okay. For, forgive me for pursuing this, Convener. You've said quite categorically, you've said clearly in the financial memorandum, uh, in 1718, you would expect 11,000 carers to receive support. Not all of them would be, of course, entitled to a break, but support of some nature. By 2021-22, there will be 153,000, or almost 154,000, uh, getting support. Again, not all of them getting breaks, but presumably a, a proportion of them. So you can predict how many people are going to need support. Surely the government then can then predict on current modelling what percentage of that 153,000 are likely to need additional care while the uh, carer is away, 
presumably have some idea of the average weekly cost of care. And so presumably you, the government would be in a position, and ought to be in a position to have an estimate of what the likely costs might be. Of course, there will be a range and of course it will depend on demand, but you must have some idea of what the likely costs will be. Well, we're continuing to discuss this with COSLA. Uh, COSLA represent local authorities. Local authorities will be uh, the, have the delivery uh, function here uh, and we are trying to uh, ensure that we can get a, a solid and reliable figure, which I will present to this committee as soon as possible. Okay, but you, you, you couldn't say whether it would be more or less than 50% of those carers would be likely to, to require a break? Uh, I think I'd want to uh, have, reflecting that and probably write back to you on that, uh, Mr Brown, I can provide you with that information. Okay. All right, and last question then, just, I mean, again in your letter to us, subsequent to your appearance, you wrote to us on the 10th of June and said, I set out in my previous reply to you of 28th May, the waiving of charges issue is to be resolved for stage two. Now, my reading of your most recent letter is that it is not to be resolved for stage two and it's going to be resolved um, after the bill has, has become law or after the bill has been passed. I have decided to resolve it by using a, a statutory instrument. I think it gives us the, the, the... What we can do here is we can, we can rush to try and resolve. This is not a straightforward matter. It's a complex matter. Or we can try and put in place the appropriate mechanism that will support carers in the appropriate way. And that's what I think uh, carers out there would expect us to do. And I think that can be best resolved by uh, having the uh, approach that we do it by uh, regulations, uh, which will be taken forward by an affirmative instrument, which is subject to parliamentary uh, scrutiny, uh, as any affirmative instrument would be, uh, and gives us the, uh, the space to ensure that we do it in the appropriate uh, manner. Now, that's how I've decided to resolve the matter. So that is the resolution we're taking forward by a statutory, statutory instrument. Do, do you not think that's just delaying resolution, though, as opposed to resolving it? I mean, just to say we're going to have some regulations on it isn't actually resolved. The issues remain the same. You're just delaying a decision on the issues. It, no, I mean, it's, it's clearly imminent. We continue to discuss this with uh, local government and uh, uh, the national carers organisations. And incidentally, I think... It, uh, carers out there would want to know that we are resolute in our commitments we have made to them. This is just the mechanism by which we seek uh, to deliver them. I, I wouldn't uh, argue that's any more a delay than any other form of statutory instrument in any bill that's taken forward. We deliver many things by that mechanism. Uh, I've been involved in uh, scrutinising many bills uh, in my time as a member of the Scottish Parliament by which we seek to take forward uh, statutory, statutory obligations by way of regulation. I'd don't think that's any different in this approach. Okay, I close simply by saying I, I, I strongly uh, believe the government ought to produce a supplementary financial memorandum here because I, I think you've missed potentially the biggest slice of the cost, if not one of, if not the biggest, certainly one of the biggest slices. And therefore, I don't think the financial memorandum is is best endeavours. But um, convener, I'll, I'll leave it at that point. Okay, thank you for that. That's uh, concluded questions from the committee, but I've still got a few more questions. I mean, you've said, Minister, that you do not want to rush to resolve this, but it's 16 weeks since you, you, you were last at committee. Um, and all, well, as you know, as you've said on a number of occasions, you were a member of this committee, and yet you say there's no defined uh, mechanism, or, um, and you've also said in a quote that you've not defined what it will cost, but it won't be £30 million. Pounds. But, you know, the financial memorandum obviously indicates that this is your best estimates. So is it going to be 29 million or 9 million or 15 million? You know, we really have to have a wee bit more information mm -hmm. because it's not as if we're asking you back after you were here last week. I mean, 16 weeks is quite a long period of time. I would have thought that negotiations and deliberations would have progressed somewhat even before you came to committee and before the financial memorandum was actually published, let alone in the 16 weeks since you were last here. So can you, uh, do you not feel that it's somewhat unsatisfactory? If you were think, if you were back here on this committee, how would you be viewing this position? Well, I, I recognise uh, that uh, the members of this committee take their scrutiny role uh, very seriously. I did that when I was uh, a member of this committee as well. All I can be convener is... is candid as I can be, and uh, what I'm telling you is we are currently in dialogue with COSLA around this matter, and we've not reached agreement yet. Now, uh, clearly, it would be uh, it would have been better if I was able to come along today and say that we were at that place. We're not at that place. I hope to be there very soon, 
and as soon as we are, I will inform this committee. But, but I mean, how long is very soon? Is it going to be a week, two weeks, three weeks? I mean, does it seem, is there any deadline for the conclusion of these discussions? Uh, I would stage one approaching, you know. I would uh, certainly uh, hope to do it imminently. I think it should hopefully only be a matter of weeks. Right. Okay. Um, Jackie, sorry, you want to come back in with a Yes, uh, to a question to you, convener, because I'm not sure of what we can and can't do, given the, the evidence we've had today. But I was wondering whether it would be appropriate to consider a supplementary note to the committee's report, um, given you know what we've heard here from the minister today. Well, we'll sit and discuss this matter when we have a private, a private session on how we take this matter forward. OK, well, I think that's concluded all our, our, our questions on this matter. Thank you very much, uh, um, Minister. OK, I'm just going to have a two-minute recess to allow um, uh, our witnesses to leave, and then we'll go into a private session. Fourth item of business is to consider a negative statutory instrument in relation to the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Scotland Act. Just want to know if members have any comments they would like to make. Okay. Well, there appear to be no comments uh, from members on that particular issue. We will now move into private session.